Hey everybody. Uh, today we're going to be exploring and analyzing the crucial role of control groups in scientific research uh, with a special spotlight for the study that's being conducted at the moment by Ben Thompson. So in scientific research, a control group is basically a standard. It's like a point of reference. It's a group that doesn't receive the treatment being uh, investigated, or in this case, yeah, no, that's not going to be getting the sound therapy. And this principle has extra weight in tinnitus research due to the highly subjective nature of tinnitus. So the subjectivity of tinnitus absolutely can't be ignored. The individual experience of tinnitus varies significantly, and this makes any treatment effectiveness really highly subjective as well. Like, this underlines pretty much the importance of control groups, or placebo in this case. So, for example, one person can think that he's getting better, and, you know, in his mind, he is getting better. So, for example, yeah, like, or he feels better or psychologically or something like that. So let's say we're assessing the impact of sound therapy on tinnitus, right? Our test group undergoes sound therapy while the control group doesn't. And by comparing these outcomes, we can actually understand and determine the effectiveness of sound therapy. And that's how it works. So if we take a look at the specific test study conducted by Ben Thompson, uh, he claims the effectiveness for sound therapy and... Um, as he says, he will. He does not have a control group, obviously, and he says that he will compare the treated individuals to those who, for example, did nothing and improved on their own. Yes, how he says. Now, on the surface, this might sound like a control group, but actually there are some pretty significant issues with this uh, approach of his. First of all, uh, Thompson's comparison group isn't a, it's not a true control group. Like, people just, you know, not doing anything, or just generally speaking, aren't under the same conditions as those in a true control group. So they're not monitored or assessed consistently, and a multitude of uncontrolled variables could be influencing their tinnitus experience. A proper control group would involve people receiving a placebo treatment um, one as an example of a control group, yes? Something that, you know, mimics sound therapy but has no therapeutic effect, for example. Let's say something that is not Ben Thompson's Zen sounds, as he calls it. Yeah, just some random sounds. And, for example, a different control group that is doing nothing. Yeah, so two control groups is better than one. Uh, then we can confidently compare and attribute any changes in tinnitus experience to the therapy itself. So any results from Ben Thompson's study are pretty much absolutely worthless um, without a control group, yeah. Now that we've gone over why Ben Thompson's study is malarkey, uh, let's actually talk about control groups. Uh, for example, the control groups in uh, Susan Shore's uh, study that uh, has been recently conducted. Uh, so to get the most reliable results, we need to take a step further. Uh, so the gold, the absolute gold standard in the medical world at the moment by people who are actually researchers and not scammers trying to sell you garbage, the gold standard is the double-blinded placebo-controlled study. So in this study, there are two main components. First is the placebo control. This means that the control group uh, receives a placebo treatment, yeah, like something that mimics the therapy to a degree that does not allow the person to understand or the person in the study um, to be uh, to understand if you know the difference. Yes, but there's like no effect, for example. Uh, this way we can actually directly compare the effects of the actual treatment versus no treatment at all, or the sham treatment as it's called. And secondly, we have the double-blinded aspect. Uh, and in a double-blinded study, neither the participants nor the researchers know who's receiving the actual treatment and who's receiving the placebo. And this actually removes the risk of bias in interpreting the results. So back to tinnitus research. Um, again, about the subjective nature of tinnitus, yeah, everybody having their own, um, their own definition of their own tinnitus, a double-blind and placebo-controlled study, a uh, design of a study, for example, in Susan Shore's study, is absolutely crucial. By keeping like both the researcher and the participant, I guess, in the dark, uh, we can make sure that any reported changes in tinnitus severity actual severity, yeah, are due to the treatment and not to, like, expected um, expected bias. 
So, as I mentioned previously, tinnitus for some individuals shows a natural regression uh, or an improvement over time without treatment. Um, a study, actually many studies by Abby McCormick and others, uh, specifically the one I'm talking about is in 2016, uh, showed that a significant number of people had their tinnitus in intensity decrease over a period of a year without doing anything. Yes, And this, again, emphasizes why placebo control is essential in tinnitus research. Yeah, so it allows us to differentiate the natural progression of tinnitus, which is proven by many studies, from the effects of the, you know, whatever's being studied. Yeah? Without a placebo group, you know, we uh, can risk, and I, I say this all the time, we can risk attributing natural improvement to the therapy. Now, at the moment, um, I assume Ben Thompson is going to be using the TFI, or the Tinnitus Functional Index, um, to assess the tinnitus intensity, right? Um, however, this tool, or this, this, um, this index, it's important to know that it is very, very limited. Yeah, so the TFI generally measures quality of life, um, interference, emotional distress, and all of these things massively depend on the person themselves. For example, one person with mild tinnitus can have a severe reaction to it, like, for example, anxiety, panic attacks, you know, suicidal thoughts, while somebody else with a different mentality can accept it much easier. So it depends on the person. So other other methods have to be used to measure tinnitus severity or loudness yeah so yeah basically the point of this video is to say is to explain uh, why ben thompson's study is uh, garbage and why it shouldn't be trusted and also i'd love to receive some commentary from ben thompson himself about the points made in this video